And we're going to be looking at apologetics today. We're on our apologetics sermon series. And apologetics has nothing to do with apologies. Apologetics is about understanding the reasons to believe. Faith is a step of faith, but it's also a step of reason. And there's good reasons to believe in the Christian faith. It's not just a fable, not just a myth. There's a lot of historical things that have happened in the Bible. And there's a lot of good science behind Christian faith. It's about being able to play away games. Today is a home game. When Jen's up here playing and uh, leading us in singing, this is a home game. We're believers here. I believe that uh, everyone here is baptized. Everyone here knows the Lord. Everyone here is open to his Holy Spirit. Everyone here trusts the Bible. But there are people outside these doors who don't. I'm sure that's not a shock to you here in California. Not all of your neighbors, not all of your family members, not all of your friends are people who have the same values you do. And playing a home game is fine, but we also need to be able to play away games. And that's what apologetics is about. How do we behave in public? How do we carry ourselves? How do we engage in conversations? And I basically see everything in terms of a bowling alley, even though I'm a terrible bowler, that's not the point, but the gutter balls, one gutter ball is being so obnoxious with people about our faith that they get turned off. Who thinks there's people like that occasionally? Uh, I ran into a guy, I've told you about this before, on Main Street, who's a street preacher. He says, do you know the Lord? I says, yeah, I know the Lord. And, uh, know the Lord, love the Lord. He says, you don't look saved. You know, so, so, so there are crabby people out there that uh, throw a gutter ball on one side. The other gutter ball is just rolling over and playing dead and letting the culture tell us what to think. And there's a lot of wood in between those gutter balls. And we want to be able to do a better job of engaging the culture with our worldview. Because the truth is, should history go on for another few hundred years, this culture will go away, but our faith won't. This faith outlives everything. The Christian church is the most durable and uh, um, long-lasting organization in world history. It outlives empires, outlives armies, outlives whole languages. There was no such thing as English when when this faith started. And so we will outlive everything. So you're betting on the right horse. So playing an away game, I think, is a really big key. So why do we do apologetics? And you can look up apologetics on your phone. It's a whole field of thought. Our men's group is going through apologetics right now and having a really good time with it. It helps us to uh, to quiet our own doubts about the faith. It helps to recalibrate our worldview. We Christians have a worldview. We're going to talk about that today. And our worldview determines our behavior. What you believe about the world determines how you act in the world, how I act in the world. And it, it sort of strengthens our worldview. It gives us more assertiveness in a hostile culture because we know that in the end uh, that we win and our culture is stronger than the world's culture, always has been, always will be. And there's good reasons to believe the things that we believe. Also helps us to uh, remove barriers for other people. A lot of people have barriers to coming to faith and based on their sense of science or their sense of politics or whatever it is. And we can help them with that by removing some of their barriers through conversations with them that don't go defensive, having good conversations with people who are not people of faith. So today is number three in our series, and God is the best explanation for nature's design. So our first question is, is nature designed or is it just randomly appearing? And if so, if it is designed, what is the best explanation for that? This is a personal issue for me. When I first started working at age 16, I started missing church and because I was working on Sundays at a grocery store and I kind of liked missing church and I thought, this is kind of nice. Maybe I won't just do this whole church thing real seriously. Maybe I'll just sort of kind of believe. And by the time I went to college, I wasn't going to church very often. I was sort of a wannabe agnostic. But the challenge for me was that I am an outdoor person and I could not get past the design of nature. The design of nature kept calling me back to the faith. I was in the Pacific Northwest in college, Tacoma, Washington, and it's gorgeous up there. There's Wendy and I were in the hiking, camping, rafting group called the Outdoor Recreation Club, and we were out in it all the time, and it's, it was just magnificent. Bud, you grew up in the Pacific Northwest. You know what some of that looks like up there. It's amazing. My wife and I met on Mount Rainier in the ice caves. 
at, at a trip with the outdoor rec club. And I could not get past the idea that this stuff all looks designed. And that really kept me moving back towards the faith. And then I had a more personal encounter with God later on in college, which cemented my, my uh, um, trip back to the church. And it really is a personal issue for me. We have hummingbird feeders. We had two out at our desert place. Now I bought another one at the dollar store, so now we have three. And I love to watch hummingbirds because for me, I, I just cannot believe that anything like a hummingbird would just emerge out of random whatever because it is just amazing. Their wings beat at I don't know how many times per second. Their heart beats faster than you can even imagine. And they migrate to South America, for goodness sake. I mean, it's the craziest thing. They're kind of high strung. You know, they kind of just chase each other away a lot. And they're, they're, you know, if your heart was beating that fast, you'd be high strung too. But still, it's, it's just amazing to me. I've said this before. If we could come up with a weapon like, like a hummingbird that wouldn't need a power source, we could reproduce on its own, which could live off the land and could move like it does and evade radar and everything else, we'd win every war. I mean, it, but we can't design something like that. Even if we tried, we couldn't design something like that. Little eggs, we had a hummingbird nest in our backyard. It was so funny watching these little hummingbirds and they kept getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And finally they fell out of the nest because they were too big. And that's kind of the idea, you know, that uh, they got pushed out of the net, out of the nest. And uh, it's, it's a personal issue for me. Design didn't make me a born again Christian. That came later, but it drew me back into the church because I couldn't ignore it. I just couldn't ignore the design of nature. So we're going to look at the design argument today for the existence of God. Most philosophers, secular or otherwise, will tell you that the design argument is the most convincing argument for the presence of God. And if you've ever looked at all the arguments for the existence of God, there's a lot of good ones. We looked at one last week, why is there something rather than nothing? But this week we're going to look at one that's even more convincing. It's also called the teleological, teleo logical. So let's say that together. Teleo logical. Teleo logical is a Greek word for it has a purpose. Designed for a purpose. That nature has a purpose. And you'll see this in secular nature shows. My wife and I love to watch secular nature shows. Not that we're ex excited that they're secular, but you know, typical National Geographic things and all that kind of stuff. And we love watching these shows, and they're absolutely amazing. And they're often they often slip into saying, "Well, the beak of this bird was designed for this, and the purpose of this flipper is to do that." And they keep slipping into design language without even noticing. You'll see this in every nature show. They they slip into the design thing because it's so obvious that they keep talking about it. There is just no way that nature could randomly emerge. So it's called the design argument. It's also called the teleological argument. We've all heard the phrase, things happen for a reason, and that's part of the teleological argument. Things have a purpose. If they have a design, they have a purpose. You don't design something without a purpose. If you design something, it's so it can do something. That's the whole idea. Craig has a really cool Jeep. It was designed to go off-road. If you take your little Hyundai off-road, it won't work. It's not designed for that. It's designed for roads with, you know, it's, it's designed for freeways, not for that kind of thing. Well, here's the problem. A lot of people, when I get into talks with them, secular people, they'll say things like, well, it used to be that we believed that there was a thunder god, but now we know what lightning is, and eventually we'll understand everything and we won't need God. That's called the God of the gaps argument. The God of the gaps is science understands this. We don't understand this, so we attribute it to God. But science is getting bigger. Faith is getting littler. Eventually, it'll take over everything and we'll understand everything if we just look at it long enough. And what they tell us is you just believe in a God of the gaps. You just believe that God is for those things we can't understand. But let me put it to you this way. Let's say you're on Gilligan's Island. For those of you too young to know what Gilligan's Island is, ask an older person. You're on a, a desert island, and a three-hour tour led you there. You know, there you are on this desert island. And you start to explore this desert island because you're in a TV series, and you've got a few years to go. So you've got some time to explore this desert island. And you're looking around, and 
who thinks that after three or four years, you can understand more and more about the island. You can learn more about the island. And there's a volcano in the very center. And you start to climb that volcano. Now you're at the beach, and you see the ocean, and you see quite a ways out. But if you climb the volcano, you see farther out. Let's say you explore the island, and you map the island, and you get to be an expert on the island. You know where all the animals are. You know where all the plants are. You get it all figured out. You come up with this perfect map of the island. You have raised your awareness of the island, but that includes going up to the top of the volcano, and from the volcano, you can see 10 times as much ocean. See, I don't believe in a god of the gaps. I believe that the more we understand with science, the bigger we realize the universe is, and the more we don't understand. The part we don't understand is getting bigger, because science is running into all kinds of limitations. And as you climb that mountain of science, you see farther and you realize how much you don't know. And we're just amazed at how much we don't know. One of the biggest blessings of getting older, and there's a lot of blessings to getting older. Those of you who lament getting older, it's a great thing to get older. Uh, it really is, because your knowledge is triple what it was 40 years ago. But if you're wise, you understand that your percentage of what there is to know is going down. As you climb that mountain, you realize how much we don't understand. So I don't believe in a God of the diminishing gaps. I think the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. And basically, I don't believe that we just have a few unsolved problems with this God, this, this uh, little piece here, this puzzle piece on the slide, a God of the gap. Well, that, we don't understand that, so it must be God. That's the God of the gaps. I don't believe in that. I believe that it's not about just a few unsolved problems. It's about the enduring mysteries that come about through deep thinking. The more you think, the more you realize there's some big enduring mysteries out here. That's the ocean out there when you climb the volcano. You realize how much we don't know. And we have the God of the gaps versus Jesus and his worldview. I hate to break it to you, but Jesus didn't come here just to let us off the hook. He didn't come here just to, well, they've screwed up, so I'm going to make sure that they get to go to heaven. That's not the point. Did that happen? Sure it did, but that's not it. The reason he came here was to teach us about the kingdom. He came here to teach us about the kingdom. All his parables are about the kingdom. The kingdom's like this, the kingdom's like that. Then he demonstrated the power of the kingdom. And what is the kingdom? The kingdom is the power behind everything. And the source of it is Abba, and we have, or the Father, and we have access to that power. If you've ever been in a prayer session where you laid hands on someone's shoulder and started praying, you felt the power of the kingdom flowing through you. Sometimes you experience it more than the person you're praying for. And some big things start to happen. You feel it sometimes when you're singing here in church. You feel it sometimes when you're in the Word. You feel it sometimes when you're out in nature. You sense the power behind all of this. The conscious power, conscious benevolent, loving power behind everything. And Jesus taught a worldview that was not a God of the gaps. Well, we understand physics, but we don't understand this, so there must be a God. No, he wasn't saying that. What he was saying is God's behind everything. Behind your consciousness, behind every atom. I love my, one of my favorite uh, theologians is Abraham Kuyper from Holland. And he said, uh, I'll translate it into our measuring things. He said, there's not one cubic inch of the universe where God doesn't say that's mine and where he isn't generating that and holding it in existence. And so, basically, Jesus had a worldview that was about the kingdom. And I'll prove it to you. Mark 1, 14. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is the very first thing he said in public. Now, after that, John the Baptist was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is that power behind everything. And he demonstrated that power, and he taught that power, and he sent people out two by two to operate in that power. Go, heal the sick, raise the dead, and tell them the kingdom is near. And by near, he didn't mean it's about to come. He meant at hand. It's right here, available. Something's at hand. It means it's available. In the morning, this morning, when I was sitting in my chair, putting together a list of prayer things for the week, I like to have my coffee mug within reach. Just right there. I don't want to have to reach around backwards and uh, or you know get out of my chair to get it every time I want a sip of coffee. I want it within reach. And what he's saying is, this power is within reach for everybody. 
And this is a kind of very potent worldview that he had. And yes, it goes on forever. And yes, you get to spend eternity with him. And yes, he does forgive your sins. But his main job was not to forgive our sins. People, God didn't create us just to forgive us. I'm going to create a bunch of failures so I can forgive them and bring them to heaven. That's not the point. He created magnificent people who have a purpose. And saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is where? At hand. Repent ye, metanoia, which in Greek is come to a higher understanding, come to a higher level. Get up and, and get the window seat in the plane and see what's really going on and believe this good news. He was teaching about the kingdom. And that's a potent worldview. It's not the God of the gaps, people. It's the God of everything. God is directing your day today. God is with you all the time. God is part of your consciousness. God is, is wanting to, to engage you in prayer so that you can tap into that power. God is also an artist. This is the shell of a nautilus. It is fantastic how God creates things. The more I get out into nature, and there's nothing my wife like, my wife and I like more than going for hikes in nature, the less impressed I am by human art exhibits, especially modern art. A lot of modern art's just stupid. I, I, I love the governor of Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, Jesse the Body Ventura, who was a pro wrestler. He said, "If I can do it, it's not art," which I thought was just a fantastic, uh, a fantastic way of looking at art, but. I'm very unimpressed with museums these days. The more I get out na into nature, the less impressed I am with the kind of art that we put together. Now, art is great. Art is a great way for you to express yourself. Go ahead and do art. But people, uh, compared to what God puts together, it's really not much. Look at that shell. And that thing just continues to grow. And Jesus said in Luke 12, 27, consider the lilies of the field. Every 20 or 30 years, there's a super bloom in the desert. We've had two of them in the last seven years, which is rare. You pick up any handful of sand in the desert, and there are hundreds, hundreds of flower seeds in that handful. And when the rain is at the right point, at the right, if there's just enough rain, the desert will be carpeted in color because those seeds are there all the time. There's a place called Clark Dry Lake out near Borrego Springs where we have our desert place. It only fills up every 20, 30 years, but when it does, I kid you not, shrimp show up. They just come out of the mud. I don't know what form shrimp are in while it's just dry and baked there for 20, 30 years, but you ever seen Huell Hauser on TV? Look at his thing on Clark Dry Lake. That's amazing. These things just come out of the ground. They just come back after 20 years. Where did they go during that time? I just, I, Hulhauser is fantastic. But Jesus says, consider the lilies. Consider the lilies. Look at these fields. Solomon and all the stuff he put together, all the art museums, doesn't compare to the beauty of a super bloom. My guess is Jesus was walking through a super bloom. They have a Mediterranean climate there, and they was walking through it thinking, look at this. This is magnificent. When the super bloom hits, the highway backs up for 20 or 30 miles to get out to the desert to see it. It's like a parking lot because people want to see it because it's so much better than anything we can put together. I want you to guess what this is. That's salt under a microscope. Just the structure of salt. And so many salts are out there. I was a chemistry guy in college, and there are so many salts. You put a certain mineral in water, and it tends to separate into a positive and negative ion, and all of this stuff happens just perfectly. Isn't it nice that they've come up with salt water pools now rather than the old, remember the old chlorinated stuff? It was just make you smell terrible and everything for the rest of the day. They've learned how to use salts to have the same cleansing sort of thing as anything else. The magnificence of the design out there, and the more we look at microscopes, and the new James Webb Space Telescope, which just got put out there, the pictures we're going to get, the big pictures and the little pictures, we go big, we go little. It is mind-blowing what we're going to see out there in creation. Psalm 19, verse 1. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. One of the big challenges we have is with light pollution in the big city. Where we live in Huntington Beach, it's so bright downtown that we see like five stars, you know, uh, it, it, not much. You go out to the desert, and there's more stars than there is black on some nights, especially with a new moon. You just see amazing, amazing stuff up there. And the ancients saw that all the time. And they marveled at the skies and all of the handiwork that's up there. I want to talk to you just for a second about a cell inside your body called DNA. Now, my wife and I use these little, what do you call these little chips that we put into the drone and the, the little... The, SD cards, yes, micro SD cards, whatever. They hold a certain amount of, of information, some gigabytes or something. A gram, which is one of these little things which we have, holds a certain number of bytes, megabytes, gigabytes, whatever. You know how much a gram of DNA holds? 215 petabytes. That's 215 million gigabytes in one gram of DNA inside the cell of your body. That is more information than all of the stars in all of the galaxies in all of the universe in every cell of your body. It is, this is why we all look different, by the way. It is amazing how those things get activated. And when a baby is conceived, how genetics from both sides, mother and father, come together and create this brand new code, which is totally unique. 215 petabytes in one grab of DNA. The complexity and this, if we could store that much energy or we could store that much information, we'd know everything. I mean, it, it, you, you think Google is cool. This is like, you know, bazillions more than that. And that's inside every cell of your body. And we're going to talk about how those get activated in just a second, which is a total mystery to everyone in science. So who thinks that's kind of impressive? 215 petabytes of information, as opposed to your little SD card, which is like, you know, eh, nothing. Psalm 104, 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions, and the earth is in a perfect place. When I was growing up in the 1960s, we believed that there may be civilizations on Mars. My teacher told me, there were probably canals on Mars because we can see that they've probably dried up over time. And, uh, and Star Trek came out in the mid 60s. And we assumed that every planet we went to, we could just beam down and breathe the air and there'd be other people. We thought it would be like the Spanish explorers and the Portuguese and the Dutch who went out and found other civilizations and we would meet them and all this would happen. We all assumed that there'd be life all over the place and there isn't. We need very special circumstances for life to exist. Elon Musk wants to put people on Mars. One of the biggest challenges is that there's so much radiation. It's twice as far from the sun as Earth. But your chances of getting a lethal sunburn, in other words, solar radiation, is way higher because they don't have anything to protect you from it. And they have to figure out how they're going to live on Mars without that protection. It's kind of scary. It's hostile. We keep looking for life everywhere, but life needs very specific things to work. And now scientists are telling us that the chances of us ever encountering, even through communication, another civilization are almost zero. Because th the situation has to be so perfect that they'd have to be close enough to send a message that we'd actually get. And this is why we don't run into other people, if there are any. The Earth has a 23 degree tilt. If it was a little bit more tilted or a little bit less, the seasons would be all out of whack. 23 is perfect, by the way, for the seasons to, for the sun to warm at different times of the year, different parts of the planet in order to create the food chain. Without the tilt, there'd be no food chain. Without the food chain, there'd be no life. And we need that variation in temperature from season to season in certain areas. And you need death in the winter for there to be soil. That's where places that are colder often have better soil because the leaves, <coughs> the leaves die and create soil, all that stuff. It all works out with the ocean currents and all the things that go with that. The size of the moon. Earth has an abnormally large moon in proportion to the size of our planet. 
Jupiter has little moons, but they're like they're like pieces of sand around a gigantic planet. We have a a, a moon that's one sixth the size of the Earth, which is really large, which has stabilized which has stabilized the rotation of the planet because that gravitational field of a big moon has stabilized the planet, which is why I can tell you in three years what the tide's going to be here in Huntington Beach because it's so stable and so perfect that you can predict it that quickly. Lunar and solar eclipses. I think this is God just showing off. We're going to get an eclipse here. I think it's tomorrow or the next day tonight. Do you know that Earth is perfectly positioned with the Earth and the, the Moon and the Sun so that when the Earth throws a shadow on the Moon, it perfectly covers it within one degree. And we get a solar eclipse, the Moon perfectly covers it within one degree. That's just showing off. I, I think God is just messing with us. The chances of that are... The chances of both of those eclipses being exactly perfectly covering the other thing, is, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. The magnetosphere, that's what protects us from solar rays. Mars doesn't have one. The moon doesn't have one. Most planets don't have one. We have one because we just happen to have a magnet inside of our planet. A gigantic iron magnet with a positive and negative charge, which is why you can use a compass, which is why it works. And that sends out a magnetosphere around the Earth, which protects us from solar rays. Mars doesn't have it. Most planets don't have it. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't be here. The fact that it's there and protecting us is magnificent. We didn't even know it was there until we started setting up satellites. I told you about the Star Trek people and beaming down and that we were just going to run into all these people, but no, because it needs to be perfect for life to make it. Life has to be absolutely perfect for it to exist. The conditions of Earth are perfect. We see this lush planet from out there, and we look at these other planets, and it's just really hostile. You think it's hostile in the desert when it's 111. Try some of these other, try Mercury, try Venus. It's 800 degrees all the time. The Russians have sent all kinds of probes to Venus to try to land there. The probes melt when they land. 800 degrees all the time. Uh, it's, it's nasty. Talk about global warming. We have just found out that the eye is precise, precisely calibrated enough where the eye can, can actually pick up one photon. How's that for precision? One photon, one little packet of light, and your eye can perceive it. Eyes are amazing. It's a little wet, couple little wet grapes inside your head, folks. I mean, just think about it. And they last 80, 90 years, and they still work. That is crazy. I don't know how my eyes got through junior high. I'd get in fights and scrapes and scruffles and all kinds of stuff, fall off my bike and do all kinds of terrible things that junior high kids do, and my eyes are still here. It's just amazing. I got punched in the eye lots of times. They're still here. So it is fantastic. It is absolutely the eye, human eye. Robert, you and I were talking about that just this last week. The human eye is just absolutely. It tells us when things are rotten, by the way, and you shouldn't eat them in the fridge because the color's wrong. Crazy stuff what our eyes can do. It is, you are worthy, O oh Lord, this is Revelation 4.11, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Here's one of the biggest ones. Here's a big fat word to learn today. I had to learn this. Dana Hansen taught it to me. He's our partner pastor at Lifehouse up in the valley. We do, I don't know if you guys know this, but we do sermon series together. The last few years, we've been, they've been following our sermon series topics. And our men's group on Monday mornings has some people from their church, people from our church, and we go through the topic for the upcoming, upcoming Sunday. Some of you guys are part of that. And Dana taught me this word, abiogenesis. Repeat after me, abiogenesis. This is one of the biggest problems. Because I was taught in high school that in the primordial soup, lightning hit the chemicals on the earth and life came to be. Well, scientists have tried to create life out of not life for 100 years. With all of their efforts, it doesn't work. Nobody's been able to create a living thing out of a non-living thing, even trying to, even with design. 
Abiogenesis is the emergence of life from not life. And all of our smartest people have been creating all of the experiments to try to create life out of not life, and it doesn't work. It probably never will. And so to think that it just randomly happened and then evolved into more and more complex and better machines. I don't know if you guys remember the big burn I had here. I mentioned at the burn meeting. I had a huge burn on my arm, a second degree burn with a couple of third degree spots. You, I can't find it. I forgot which arm it was on. Don't you wish your car did that? Wouldn't it be nice if your house did that? Your roof fixed itself? Wouldn't it be nice if, uh, yeah, it would be nice if those things took care of themselves. But the human body heals itself, for goodness sake. Because did you believe in faith healing? I said, human body's designed to heal. All we have to do is believe in it and help it along a little bit with a good attitude. And it's amazing how things come back to life. We're designed to heal. You, you cut yourself, and 10 days later, the scab falls off, there's a little scar, and the scar eventually is... Who tells it to do that? It's crazy stuff. So abiogenesis is the belief that, or, or the, is the word for things coming into existence and we can't make it happen. Hebrews 11, verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible, came out of nothing. That's what scientists tell us too, but they have no idea where the nothing or the whole thing. There's also the hard problem of consciousness. This is a philosophical problem. The original emergence of conscious organisms from unconscious matter. At some point, the light went on. Uh, how, does, how do things become conscious? Once again, in Star Trek, Commander Data, you make something complicated enough, it'll be conscious. But that's not true. You can make something complicated, but giving it consciousness, giving it a sense of self, how do you do that? And what is it in the first place? We have no idea. But it's an enduring mystery how consciousness works. And there isn't a scientist on the planet who can tell you why, why consciousness emerges in human beings. And this is real interesting. Almost every culture believes in an afterlife. Because, on the slide, consciousness presupposes continued extension. It's impossible to conceive of consciousness stopping your consciousness stopping. Where would it go? You, you have a self there, and it presupposes continuous, eternal extension. And that's why we ask ourselves, what happens in the afterlife, not if there is one, because we can't conceive of consciousness stopping. Go ahead and try it all afternoon. It won't work. You can't, uh, can't conceive of your consciousness stopping. Much of biology isn't really science. Now, biology that deals with present things is science. Who remembers cutting up frogs and, and the like in, in high school? You, you, that's science. You're actually doing experiments on things that are there. But guess what, people? You can't do science on the past because you can't do experiments on the past. You can't observe the past. It's really just history. There's nothing wrong with history. But when scientists say that things evolved without a designer, that's not science. It's not settled science, because there's no such thing as settled science, but it's not science at all, because it's not even looking and observing anything. It's just coming up with a narrative to make sense of fossils. And coming up with a narrative to make sense of fossils is not repeatable. It's not the typical things. It's, it's not peer-reviewed. It's not anything. You just, you just have a whole bunch of stuff, and it's a narrative. It's history. There's nothing wrong with studying history, but it's not science. It's one historical one historical um, narrative for the past. Microevolution. Now, please hear me. The next two slides, you don't have to agree with me to be a good Christian. And there's a lot of, a lot of Christians who believe in microevolution or even parts of macroevolution. I don't. But here's the problem. Species just appear in the fossil record. They come out of nowhere. They, boom, there it is. They go through a long period of equilibrium and then they go extinct. Some last a long time, like cockroaches and sharks. They go on for millions of years. Some have a shorter time in the historical framework. There's the Cambrian explosion where a whole bunch of stuff just appeared. That happens. But nobody's ever been able to find actual genetic changes in that lifespan. 
if we brought back a person from 50,000 years ago and raised him in a house in Huntington Beach with our diet, they would look exactly like us. And you would not be able to tell them apart because there's a conserving quality within that whole lifespan. Genetics try to keep things working so that we can continue to reproduce with each other because if we started to vary too much, we'd end up with different species and we wouldn't be able to continue to promote the species. So they want to keep us moving. People, if you're young enough, you can reproduce, you can marry and reproduce with any human being on the earth because we're all made of the same genetic, we're all one race. We have the same genetic code. And that is because the conserving factor of DNA, it keeps us on the same railroad tracks so that we don't turn into different things. That's microevolution. That's evolution within a species. Let's look at macroevolution. That's one species becoming another species. And we've all seen the picture of the little marmot turning into a monkey, turning into an ape, turning into a person, you know, the whole thing turning into a Green Bay Packer fan, you know, whatever. It, it just kind of goes in that direction. So you see this whole kind of, kind of deal. And we've all seen that in our science books. But the truth is there's really no evidence for any macroevolution from a scientific perspective. I went to a science consortium meeting at the University of Chicago when I was in grad school just to watch scientists fight over this. They can't figure out how one species turns into another. They've got theories. And most of them don't make a lot of sense. But how does one species turn into another species, especially with the conserving thing with microevolution? First of all, there's not nearly enough time. Time is what evolutionists always say. Uh, that over a long period of time, these things can happen. There's not nearly enough time in the historical framework for these things to happen, mathematically speaking. They say, well, it's mutations which turn us into more advanced beings. That's how worms end up as people. But malmutations, in other words, bad mutations, overwhelm good ones all the time. Mistakes in the genetic code are always overwhelming the good mutations. If there's a good mutation that gives you a little bit better eyesight, there's always a bad one that gives us some birth defect. And so bad, bad uh, mutations are always overwhelming the good ones. So how is a species supposed to advance into another species? Because genetically, it doesn't work that way. Additional or more complex genes cannot be created by mutation. Information cannot be created from one form to another. You've got way more complex genetics, remember the petabytes, than a sheep. You can, you can clone a sheep. You can't clone, clone a person at this point. Why is that? Because we have a different and much more complex genetic code. So how does a species with 13 chromosomes create one with 23. And how do you create a male and female of those so that they can reproduce? It, 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 there are no models for that. Sudden emergence of body plans. Virtually every, every species we've got a fossil record of came out of nowhere. Just boom, there it is. There is no pre-whale, so to speak. There is no pre-dolphin. It, it just boom, there it is. So what do you do with these spontaneously emerging things. And here's the big one. This one bent my brain way over my IQ level. Pronounce after me epigenetics. Epigenetics is a brand new field, started in the 90s. Here's a keyboard up here. When Jen plays the keyboard, there are some keys that she doesn't touch all morning. She might touch them next Sunday but there's some she doesn't touch. I want you to imagine that those are our chromosomes, DNA, whatever. When you were first conceived, a male and female cell came together and you were a one cell organism for a very short period of time. Then you became a two cell organism, then a four cell organism. And then epigenetics kicked in. And we don't know how this works, but at some point, something tells your DNA which notes to play. It says, okay, time for a kidney cell. And a kidney cell is not the same as an eye cell or a stomach cell or a skin cell or a bone cell. And as you start to develop, different notes get played and all of your other genes get quieted so that you make the right kind of organism or organ. Nobody has any idea how that mechanism works. It, but is that not fascinating? 
Epigenetics is how you activate and quiet certain genes. And they're using that now in medicine to quiet certain genes that cause cancer and cause other things and to activate ones that create healing. You could do all kinds of things with epigenetics, but it's just at its beginning stages. But the fact that it exists, that somehow the body knows which, which genes to turn on, which ones to turn off so that it can create different organs is just off the charts mathematically impossible. And to think that that's not designed is absolutely crazy. So you get this whole epigenetic thing. The last thing I want to talk about here, invite the worship team back up, is irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. I was talking, I was speaking at a family camp at Okaboji Lake in Iowa. And I mentioned to people that I didn't believe in macroevolution. And this scientist who was there, who was a college professor, grabbed me in the cafeteria or the, what do you call it, the, the place where you eat at a Bible camp. And uh, we were there, and he said, i got to talk to you. He says, because uh, people like you are dangerous. He said, you shouldn't be out there. You don't know about, anything about science. And I said, okay. Uh, and I asked him a question. I said, how long would it take for an animal without wings to evolve wings that would actually help you fly? And I knew he had no answer for that, but he had to come up with one because he was a scientist. 400 million years, he said. It's okay. So as those wings are growing for 400 million years, and after 400 million years, it's finally able to fly, that animal would be getting less and less survivable the whole time because they'd be growing these big things that don't help. And he had no answer for that. Irreducible complexity. There are certain things that, unless they all work, they don't work at all. And the idea that, that a bird could grow wings over 400 million years, all the while that bird becomes clumsier and clumsier and clumsier and clumsier and more vulnerable because it can't fly but has bigger and bigger wings, hasn't developed the, the muscle structure. When you bite into a, a chicken breast, it's got that massive muscle going into that bone or a turkey. You see where that is? That, that takes a long time to develop. But if you can't fly, it's just getting worse. And we just get eaten. He had no answer for that, but you know, we'll move on for there. Romans 1.18, we'll close with this. But God shows his anger from heaven against the sinful wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. He says, Paul says, you can extrapolate the existence of God just from looking outside, just from seeing what's out there. You don't need the Bible to believe in God. You don't need to be hit over the head by the Holy Spirit to believe in God. You should be able to believe in God, is what he's saying, just by seeing nature. You should just see. And they, they didn't know anything about epigenetics back then. They didn't know anything about petabytes. They didn't know anything about any of this stuff. But yet Paul saw it. So here's the so what. If there, is, if there is a design, there's a designer. And if you are designed, you have a purpose. You are made in the image of God. You share his consciousness. You're a lot more like God than you're like the rest of creation. Made in the image of God. And it's the only source of our self-esteem. Because if you don't believe you're made in the image of God, and you don't believe you're here for a reason, you better hope you have a lot of money, are good looking, and are successful. Because otherwise, you've got no reason to have self-esteem. Why do we think so many young adults right now have self-esteem problems? Because they were taught in schools that say you're here by accident. A random collision of events brought you forth. And they have self-esteem classes which have nothing to fall back on other than you better be good at something. And people, there's a lot more average people than excellent people and excelling in everything. Most of us are just regular folks. If we're not made in the image of God, what basis do we have for self-esteem? What basis do we have for not hurting other people if they're not made in the image of God? What basis do we have for ethics? We're going to talk about that next week. You can't have a legal system without a God. We're going to talk about that. People, 
We need to start teaching our young people in this country that they're made in the image of God, that they're here for a reason, they're designed for a purpose, and they have value apart from their ability to achieve. We don't lose, if we don't do that, we're going to lose the whole generation. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. King David said, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. Lord, our culture is telling our young people that we're here by accident. And we're reaping the whirlwind of that. Lord, I just give you thanks for your creation. I give you thanks personally that the wonder of your creation kept me close to you during those late teen years. And Lord, I pray that people would realize how much is at stake with this truth. I pray we all get a chance to tell a young person this week that because you're made in the image of God, you have infinite worth. It's not about making the dean's list. It's not about having more money than your neighbors. It's not about being better looking. It's not about being more popular. It's not about having more likes on Facebook. Your worth is infinite. And Lord, we can tell them that we believe that about them because we believe it about ourselves. And this, our soul, knows full well.